I welcome you all back for the third session of the day, where we'll be tackling a question that was centrally raised uh, by the senior minister this morning and was touched upon by many uh, panelists throughout the day, which is the impact on Asia uh, of the ongoing tensions in, in Hormuz. We have a number of uh, senior experts and officials uh, from different parts of Asia with us at the table today to share their perspectives on the question. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Gabriel Lim. He's the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much and uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you here today. I'm very happy to uh, be here to um, sort of share my thoughts on this extremely uh, salient issue. Um, and when Ambassador Bilahari sort of invited us to, both myself and my senior minister of state who came this morning, I think it was uh, one of the fastest decisions we ever made. Um, maybe I'll just start by painting a slightly broader context um, um, that uh, was occupying me this morning when my senior minister of state was here addressing all of you. I think all of you here uh, have, may have read about our latest um, economic forecasts and our economic results. We just released it this morning. Uh, we've, in, in a nutshell, we've uh, cut Singapore's growth forecast down uh, from 1.5 to 2.5 percent full year growth down to zero to one percent growth. Um, that's as of this morning. And frankly speaking, a large part of it is due to the downturn in the electronic cycle but it's overlaid with certain structural challenges and headwinds that we see moving forward and compounded by quite a few downside risks uh, over the horizon. Uh, not just US-China, for example, but also some of the what we see with the risks of a no-deal Brexit, um, the complication arising from in some bilateral issues, Japan-Korea, maybe India-Pakistan, and I would put possibly US-Iran and what's going on in the Strait of Hormuz in that category. I would say this would be an additional cloud in a rapidly darkening sky. Um, and um, I would add that I think my SMS quote this morning had mentioned to you, the direct impact of US-Iran tensions in the Strait of Hormuz on Singapore and on Asia, the direct economic impact uh, will probably be manageable. Um, I think you would have heard the statistics, um, you know, three quarters of the oil that shipped through the strait comes to Asia, mostly China and India, I think, to a large extent, maybe Japan and Korea second tier, and Singapore below that. Um, but the direct impact of a disruption is manageable. It's not negligible, it's not something we can just write off, but at the same time, it's not something that will cripple our economies either. But when you have this on top of quite a few other um, potential downside risks, um, and compounding what is already a very complicated economic situation for the world over. I think for us, that is the, one of the main uh, concerns that we have uh, in, in the region and for the foreseeable future. I think just, so one is, the, my first point is really there, is the implication that uh, uh, disruption or continued tension in the Strait of Ormuz possibly has for the Singapore economy and some of our Asian economies as well, that's one. Uh, the second one I would say is really an expansion of uh, what my minister may have mentioned this morning, which is really what it portends for essentially international law and international agreements, uh, which have been entered into by various parties on a, on a willing basis. Uh, here, on the latter point, here I'm referring obviously to the JCPOA. Um, it was something that, imperfect or flawed as it may be, it was still something that brought the various parties together and allowed, I think, a certain platform and a certain basis for them to continue to engage one another and to get onto a, a stable and predictable path uh, towards, even if it's not normalization, at least something approaching that. And I think where you have now with uh, the various, well, two parties in particular, so moving away from that has complicated the problem. And I think therein lies one of the issues, I think, for Singapore as a small, open um, economy that's highly reliant on international rules of the road, a bit of a warning sign for us to, uh, in case there are any other international agreements or plurilateral agreements um, that uh, may, may become unwound at the margins or starting to fray at the edges. 
Uh, and here, this is a larger point again, as I said. I think what's happening in the Strait of Hormuz possibly has a larger bearing on other the rest of the world. Uh, one of the structural issues I mentioned earlier is indeed the sort of unwinding or the dilution of the multilateral trading system as we know it, and which has served us well for the last 30, 40 years. It's really one in which uh, essentially the world has sort of agreed to come together uh, regardless of the size of the economy and agreed to work with one another generally speaking on equal terms uh, where rules apply generally speaking again regardless of the whether or not the countries are big or small i say generally speaking obviously because i think real politic you all know it's not so quite so clear cut but it has generally provided a, re a sustainable predictable framework which countries have uh, benefited from especially small countries like singapore and which i think uh, uh, is one of the structural issues we are seeing starting to get diluted. We see this at the WTO uh, with the issues at the appellate body and we see this in terms of some of the multilateral uh, frameworks that are uh, entered into between different countries. So that's the second part of the st structural headwinds that we talk about. Maybe not directly related to what's going on between the US and Iran but certainly something that we think uh, is a harbinger of a larger, um, I would say, structural shift that we see in the geopolitical environment. And I think the last one is really um, what, uh, in terms of um, the attacks that we see in the tankers in the Strait of Ormuz and what it means for the way in which international waterways and international waters are managed and uh, looked after. Again, I think uh, we've made our position very clear and consistent. We condemn strong, in the strongest terms the attacks uh, that were made on the tankers in the Strait of Ormuz. Um, I think as far as we are concerned, these are international waterways, they are an important artery for the global economy and really they should allow, there should be a full passage allowed in these international waterways. Uh, we would obviously be very worried if uh, there, there, some of these uh, actions are uh, in a sense, uh, or rather the, the general environment is less respectful of some of these international rules of the road and in, in particular for Singapore, because we're so reliant on international waterways as our sea lanes of communication out to the rest of the world, as well as to, in terms of our shipping and our trading routes as well. So those are the three things that I thought I wanted to share a larger perspective of, just to you know, look at what's going on between the US and Iran, what's going on in the Strait of Ormuz, and sort of extrapolate that into a, a larger context within which the Singapore economy is operating under. Uh, like I said, I mean, um, if we do have the direct impact of any disruption over there is manageable for Singapore and I believe for the rest of the Asian economies as well. Uh, but at the same time, what would worry us is actually if these, uh, if uh, continued tensions there or if uh, escalation of tensions there, what it portends for the rest of the global economy. So I, I thought I'd leave that as a context setter and I'm happy to hear, looking forward actually to hearing my other panelists' views as well as to the questions from the floor. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lim. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Pang Wang, uh, who is the director of Shanghai Center for International Affairs. Thank you. And <clears throat> I just want to make some uh, uh, several points uh, during the limited time. <clears throat> Firstly, I think the U.S. Iran the tension the conflict. In fact, is, uh, the result is spring. China, Russia, and Europe more close to work together for uh, trying to prevent the situation in Gulf from getting worse. Also, uh, even though it is not really possible, but we still work together to try uh, to persuade the U.S. back to the Iranian nuclear deal, the framework. So I think the recently you have a conference discuss this. Our for a minute Wang Yi joins this with the EU, Russia, including the little EU in Germany, French, and UK. Uh, we will work until last minute, and the. Uh, <coughs> even for the next U.S. administration, trying to bring U.S. back. Uh, but if it is impossible to uh, prevent the situation worse, 
Uh, second point is getting oil and gas <coughs> will not be a really problem for China and other East Asian country. Uh, so long as uh, street uh, homes remain open, uh, because uh, even <coughs> the oil from the Iran the decreased. For example, China can still get enough oil gas from Saudi. Saudi now is number one. Last year, last year we import almost uh, 60 million ton of oil. Now, interesting, in a, if you said monthly, some months, Russian became number one. But next month, Saudi became number one again, something like that. But in the Middle East, Saudi is number one for the oil. For the LNG, Qatar is number one. Also interesting in the, uh, in the monthly, sometime Australia became number one. Uh, uh, sometime <coughs> Qatar number one. Oil, uh, also, some other countries uh, uh, provide oil, gas, like uh, UAE is very important, Oman. And I should especially mention Iraq. I still remember to, in 2003, many people in the US, including me, we said no war for oil against George W. Bush's war against uh, in Iraq. But uh, you know, after war, the oil not really go to US. Come to China. Now we have three main uh, oil company. And you know CNPC, you must know this. CNOC and China Pack. The three oil company in Iraq doing very well. The three main oil fields is, in fact, invested by Chinese company, of course, with BP, with Dotto. Uh, every year, as I know, I just uh, uh, call my friend. He said, uh, now every year we uh, import uh, almost 20 million ton oil from Iraq. Unfortunately, in the southern Iraq not really influenced by the ISIS war. So this is very, very important uh, for us. Even uh, if the, I said, if the homeless, uh, street homeless have some problem, we now have more oil gas by land pipeline from Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, from Central Asia, and also now the new pipeline from the Far East. We hope this will be including DP, DPRK in the future, if everything going well. Of course, we'll reach Japan, South Korea, because in Russian Far East has a lot of money, and a lot of oil and gas. So this is uh, the cooperation in the future will be very, very huge opportunity. And now I should talk some program. The real program is U.S. session. As the minister mentioned this morning, uh, we basically, we joined the United Nations session. But we oppose United States, the unilevel session. Uh, the program before the Iran nuclear, East, uh, nuclear deal, the Chinese company, if you have business in both US and Iran, you have to make decision. Or leave Iran to keep your business in US. US. Or leave US to keep your business in Iran. Like, 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 uh, like the very famous company Huawei, you know, at that time, he left Iran because he wanted to keep the business in the U.S. So, but in the end, uh, 2015, when the Iran nuclear deal signed, most, most companies want to return to Iran. The situation became very, very uh, hopeful. 
But now U.S. again do serious uh, uh, sanction. The problem is U.S. make this sanction as a domestic law. So now again, the country, the company have business in both Iran and the U.S. You have to make choice. Uh, make choice. Uh, <clears throat> so now I think the situation changed a lot. Maybe most Chinese company prefer to leave U.S. Keep their business in Iran because China-U.S. trade war more serious. It's not good condition for Chinese company to do business there. So this is a problem for the not for China only for China for the company in the other country also. Uh, if you do business in both Iran and the U.S., you have to make choice. Uh, we hope the U.S. in the near future can something change. I think my time is uh, over, so I said just here stop. Thank you very much, Professor Guang. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Hitoshi Tanaka, the chairman of the Institute for International Strategy in Japan, Japan Research Institute. Uh, <clears throat> some of you must know that this is a big holiday season in Japan. It's called Obon. Obon is uh, like Christmas holiday. Uh, but I came here. I'm not an expert on Iran, but I'm a friend of Ambassador Birahari. That's the reason why I came here. And he promised me a few moments ago a big, big dinner in Japan. So this my trip must have been very much rewarding. Uh, let me talk about the substance. Uh, I would rather like to talk about a little bit broader impact on the current situation. Current situation meaning that uh, the uh, continuous tension between the United States and Iran, what impact it would have uh, on Asia. Uh, there has been more or less consensus in the debate of today that there is no likelihood for a fledged war between the United States and Iran because simply because Trump is not prepared for it. John Bolton maybe, but yet the United States will not go for a war with Iran. Uh, and the second more or less conclusion is that the immediate solution is not foreseen. No sort of concrete resolution is foreseen at this juncture. Uh, with this, let me make assessment about four negative consequences of the current situation between Iran and United States on Asia. Four. First, uh, this is a question of, I talked about uh, in my question to uh, people in the morning that we see further decline of US credibility, uh, starting from the uh, establishment of Trump administration, he has been doing, he has been initiating lots of unilateral policies in Middle East. Uh, you know, just uh, not just a departure from the, uh, the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran, but uh, uh, his decision to move uh, the capital, the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem, the, his acknowledgement of Golan Heights as the territory of Israel, and the huge uh, weapon sale to Saudi Arabia. And again, he is calling for a uh, willing, the coalition of willing nations to protect uh, the safety of the international uh, transportation, uh, in particular tankers. Those are very, very unilateral measures. And as I said, there's not very many people, many countries who would be willing to participate in the coalition for willingness. So I'm afraid that there is going to be a damage on the credibility of the United States, which is very, very painful on Asia as well, because we would like to see a constructive America in the region of Asia, but starting from Middle East, 
their sort of credibility will be further declined. That is a bad, bad negative consequence on Asia. Second, somebody talked about, I mean, Mr. Pan uh, moments ago talked about the possibility of Chinese firms moving away from US market to Iran. And clearly, with the severe sanction from the United States and with the power of Dara, Iran will seek for alternative measures to survive. And that clearly, everybody expects that Iran is moving to China and Russia. And this will create much divisive global governance. We talked about, all the time to, talked about, there may be a second Cold War worldwide. But actually, what is taking place in the Middle East is a polarization of policies centering upon Iran. And that will lead to very, very negative impact on Asia. In both countries, Japan will obviously siding with the United States. But yet, smaller nations in Asia may find it very difficult to take side between uh, the United States uh, and China as well. The third negative impact is very clear, economic impact. Luckily, the uh, price of oil has not gone down. I mean, has not, has not gone up that much. But yet, if there were to be escalation of tension, it will uh, find in the price of oil as well. Japan is depending upon uh, its oil, 80% of its oil, coming from straight of homes. So this impact would be tremendous. Uh, lastly, the question of North Korea. North Korea, I negotiated with North Korea for the period of one year, one whole year. And they know all those development of international affairs, in particular, the you know, non-proliferation issues. Therefore, they watch the development of Iran very, very carefully. And if there were to be no diplomatic solution to that, I don't think, I don't think North Korea will move to settle things through diplomatic means. And again, they watch very carefully. There has been so much change from one administration to the other. And North Korea would become very cautious about, uh, you know, to con conclude deal with the United States in relation to the denuclearization of North Korea. So those are the four negative impact on Asia. But yet, since I am an ex-diplomat, the diplomat all the time think in terms of solution. Therefore, I would like to see the diplomacy to work, to function. And someone talked about the kind of position of the Japanese Prime Minister Abe. He has a very close relationship with uh, President Trump. He may be the only person who maintained a, such cordial relationship with Trump. And again, as you know, Japan has been uh, having a very close uh, consultative uh, discussion with Iran as well. Therefore, there is a chance here that Prime Minister Abe may be instrumental in working out the possible dialogue between the United States and Iran. I remember a time when I was political director for G7 process. And in 2004, my counterpart in the United States was John Bolton. And again, that, the, the, the Agenda at that time was a question of Iran, the nuclear development of Iran. European countries, European free, British, French, and German came to me asking to bridge the difference between Europeans and America. Because John Bolton was so adamantly denying the possibility of negotiated settlement. The Europeans were quite anxious to have a discussion with Iran. I was successful to mobilize Michi Armitage at that time, Deputy Secretary of State. And there are those sort of uh, prag pragmatic 
uh, people like John Bolton, no, not John, John Bolton, like uh, Richie Armitage or Secretary Powell. And we succeeded in overruling John Bolton. I think he has, I think his very fundamental view started from, you know, way before that. Therefore, this time, we would very much like to see someone overrule John Bolton. And again, Richie Armitage talked about that Trump, they wish to have the real transaction this time. And we would like to help that. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. Our next speaker is an uh, energy consultant specializing in energy economics and public policy, Dr. Tilak Doshi. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the recent attacks uh, in the uh, Straits of Hormuz have evidently heightened the sense of vulnerability among uh, most Asian countries. I mean, it's, it is a, seen as a, almost like a nightmare scenario. The disruption of tanker traffic in the Straits has led, for instance, uh, Yoshide Sugo, uh, Suga, cabinet secretary of the Japanese government, is be quoted as saying it was a matter of life and death for Japan's energy security. And we've talked enough about uh, the Straits of Hormuz to, to know how important it is, the world's most important oil choke point. 30% um, of total global trade in both oil and LNG passes through the Straits. 80% of that uh, of that oil passing through the strait comes to Asia. Uh, now, within Asia, the dependence on the Middle East varies by country. China is uh, at 45%. This is according to BP data for 2018. Uh, India is at 65%. And Japan uh, for 2018 was registered at 87%. So uh, the dependence on, on Middle East oil and on the freedom to to move oil through the strait is, is certainly uh, extremely concerning. Now, uh, together with this, of course, we are living in a world of weakening um, global uh, uh, growth. Um, the IMF in its latest uh, uh, forecast have, have uh, reduced the rate of growth for this year and next year. Europe and Asia in particular have weakened. Uh, China is slowing not only because of the uh, US trade tariffs, uh, but also for uh, significant domestic reasons. Uh, India as well, uh, for domestic factors again, is uh, slowing uh, rapidly. So in, in a context of slowing growth and heightened uh, 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 chances of disruption in the Straits of Hormuz, the impact of higher oil prices will certainly be uh, magnified. So um, uh, disruption of uh, oil traffic um, uh, vessels in, in the Straits uh, would lead to higher prices and therefore uh, impact the most vulnerable economies in Asia, uh, China, uh, sorry, India, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, those economies have got weak balance of payments. Um, but while we are talking of a, quite a grim scenario, uh, let's talk about the other side of the ledger, um, and I think people sometimes don't give it enough, uh, enough of um, importance uh, on, on those factors. Uh, to begin with, for example, when news first came out of the tanker attacks in, in the Straits, uh, prices spiked uh, for a day about 4%, and they pretty much fizzled out, primarily because the uh, market was far more concerned about uh, weakening demand growth for oil based on the weakening uh, global GDP. So the spike in prices were contained, and if you talk to any oil analyst today, it's the downside rather than the out, uh, upside um, that, that they're more concerned with. Secondly, I, I think this is also another factor that people don't uh, quite uh, appreciate the importance of. Now, the human mind tends to think about Stuff in physical ways, commodities and physical flows. The oil market is fungible. Essentially, it is the global price of oil that we're concerned with. Whether you get one drop of oil from the Middle East or not, if there's disruption anywhere in the world, consumers from around the world all get affected. So uh, it is important to think about the fungibility of, of, of oil markets and the flexibility of oil flow. The other major uh, factor uh, that 
uh, uh, that should be taken into account. Now, uh, for those of us who've been in the industry for, for the last 20, 30 years, the Saudis and their OPEC allies and now the OPEC plus allies uh, have played a major role in, 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 in taking care of demand and supply uh, in order to hit uh, a particular targeted price, either they curtail supply or they unleash supply, depending on the requirements of the uh, world market. But that role has reduced significantly. And that role has reduced significantly primarily because of the single most important transformative factor in modern history in the oil industry, in the oil, in the oil sector, and that's the fracking revolution. Right now, prices are set not by Saudi Arabia, but by the Texan cowboy capitalist um, driller in Texas. He sets the price of oil according to markets. And fracking oil is quite unlike drilling deep oil in, in, in typical wells. Fracking is almost a manufacturing operation. So the US shale oil and gas Plays, uh, is beginning to play a major role in setting prices. Uh, I, uh, the, the, um, uh, so it's, it's quite important to also notice that, for example, uh, India and South Korea have emerged as major importers of US oil. In fact, South Korea recently beat Canada as the single most important market for US oil, which is a dramatic change uh, uh, from, from previous uh, decades. Now, I think above all, uh, in talking about energy security issues, it's really important to, to keep our wits about us and um, one should not go overboard with hyperbole and um, uh, disaster scenarios. Uh, one should certainly uh, look very carefully at what's going on in the Gulf, uh, for sure. Um, the major Asian powers should have a Clear role, uh, clear idea as to what role they want to play in 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 oil security uh, through the Gulf. Um, now, 42 years ago, President Carter gave us gave us his uh, what is sometimes jokingly called the Meow speech, the moral equivalent of war. Now, that speech, which talked about uh, in the period of the 70s, the oil shocks and and grim scenarios again. That speech was responsible for more bad policy and economic losses than almost any speech uh, on energy in the U.S. history. Um, so it is critical that we are aware of both the downsides but also the flexibility of markets and the importance of pragmatic thinking and planning uh, in facing these challenges that, that we face today. I thank all the panelists for their insightful remarks. Now I would like to open the floor for your questions and as customary, please identify yourselves and be brief. My name is Shikata, I Japan Forum International Relations. Let me ask Mr. Doshi about the shale oil and gas. You pointed out the shale gas is quite different from the others in that it is uh, based upon fracturing. But as far as I know, oil, shale oil and gas can be produced economically as long as the uh, crude oil is higher than $30 per barrel. And also shale oil and gas may cause environmental problems or health problems in that the producers uh, inject highly pressured water containing chemical components like a land subsidence or contamination of drinking water are now found in problems in the United States. So how reliable do you think the shale oil and gas from now on? Thank you very much. We can have one more. I'm uh, Esfander Batmagelish. This is a question for Professor Guang. Um, in July, China's General Customs Administration declared the equivalent of around 200 to 300,000 barrels per day of oil imports from Iran, which is a fairly public way of saying that 
they're going to defy the U.S. sanctions on uh, exports of Iranian oil. I wonder if you could elucidate a little bit about what this might represent about Chinese state policy in defying the unilateral sanctions and to what extent China's government may be able to push that defiance beyond the energy sector to other commercial actors. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, uh, now, you're, you're right, uh, the break-even price for oil and uh, in, in, in most areas uh, where they're exploiting for shale gas, uh, for shale oil, uh, is at the $40, $50 uh, uh, per barrel mark. Uh, now, uh, of course, shale, uh, depending on whether they're sweet spots or, or they're not so great, uh, good spots where it's more gas rather than oil, then the break-even prices go up. But the $40 to $50 barrel mark uh, is... It's about then, as as you must know, uh, Brent today was fifty seven dollars plus. Uh, so, um, so shale uh, is is in play and uh, is is an economic um, uh, uh, proposition. Now, the uh, I won't go into too much detail, um, uh, but shale oil and gas is fundamentally different from drilling oil in the traditional way because of the very rapid uh, and cheap uh, drilling that they can do. So as I said previously, it's more manufacturing rather than mining economics. So therefore, the, the elasticity of supply, the, the ability to respond to changes in demand, uh, they, they're far faster than, than traditional producers. Your second question on, on the environmental impact on, on shale. Now, uh, it's important to know that the enormous, particularly in the mass media, uh, it is important to know uh, that there is a lot of misinformation going on. So to date, there is not a single complaint to the EPA regarding any kind of uh, contamination of groundwater by shale, uh, shale uh, um, uh, uh, wells that are being drilled. Now, of course, accidents happen, but accidents happen in any industrial enterprise. But shale um, uh, fracking uh, has not proven to be environmentally damaging like many of the environmental NGOs and mass media reports tend to report. Now, so the EPA, as I said, did many, many studies on this. The EPA under uh, the previous regime, under President Obama, was particularly... Uh, sensitive to uh, environmental NGOs. So there are no studies that have shown that a shale is uh, in any way more damaging than, than any other uh, traditional manufacturing NGO. Uh, <clears throat> There's a case you just mentioned, I don't know uh, much, but I should say, uh, now in China, so many companies, yeah, National company, government-run company, and private company. Uh, not, not long ago, U.S. Uh, uh, again is ascension against one private company in in Shenzhen or something. Uh, I think the government maybe cannot control everything. Yeah. So that case, I only heard. I don't know uh, the in detail. So I think uh, maybe the, you first you should know is. Uh, government-run company, national company, or private company, uh, then they, use, they can use their agent in, in Thailand, for example, in Pakistan, or in some, the, we, uh, we have a lot of programs uh, about the weapons sale, uh, even with Israel. Uh, when Israel uh, come, said, why you send weapons to Syria or to some country? We just check. Oh, this is a company. It's agent. Agent is agent, something like that. So this is really very difficult. Uh, now the, uh, uh, <coughs> the Huawei's uh, Mitterrand's daughter was arrested by Canada. Also, Sam said he, she responsible so for some selling or some, uh, some the business with uh, Iran. But uh, really, uh, nobody know what happened. Uh, I I don't know exactly. So, firstly, you should uh, check this which company to do this. 
next round of questions. Good evening, Sumita from RSIS here. Uh, I had a quick question for Dr. Doj. I'm hoping it's an area that you've sort of looked at closely is India's imports of Iranian oil. And um, it's been interesting because it's a partner country of the US, unlike you know, China, it's a different relationship, that you sort of privately disagree. Um, has India borne any costs at all? Because mostly they're state-owned refineries. Um, we don't hear much about it. Or was the previous round in 2012 a lot more painful because it was the first time these refineries had to retrofit and you know spend money on changing things? I'm just curious. We can take uh, one more. Okay, we'll proceed with this first. Um, from from what I know generally, um, um, maybe not uh, in great detail. Uh, now, when when the U.S. imposed sanctions, uh, uh, they provided exemptions in the in the first part of those sanctions, uh, and then they took away those uh, sanctions. Uh, if uh, there's exemptions to those sanctions in March this year, uh, if I'm not wrong. Now, uh, most countries, in fact, did cut back um, uh, in the early days in order to uh, to uh, to prepare themselves for full sanctions uh, because they all knew that these were exemptions that could have been could be lifted any time. Uh, now, in terms of adjusting to the loss of Iranian oil and having to buy other oil. Iranian oil generally is heavy and sour, uh, and it's typical sort of Middle East sours. So having replacements for Iranian oil hasn't proven to be that difficult. Um, now, there were some difficulties because at the same time, Venezuela was dropping out as well, and Venezuela is also heavy and sour. Uh, but, you know, we've just heard um, the data says that from a from pre-sanctions levels of 2.5 million barrels per day of Iranian exports, I think they've been reduced to something like 100,000 barrels per day. So the world goes on fine without Iranian oil. It's really not, not that big a deal. Any other questions? Okay, I'll, I have my own questions, so I will... I'll, uh, I'll use this as an opportunity to ask for the uh, panelists whether, I mean, I, I want to reverse the table a little bit and ask if you see any role uh, for the Asian uh, countries in de-escalating the tensions in Hormuz or in general having any impact on the ongoing tensions between the US and Iran. Apart from sending messages of goodwill or calling for peace, are there any concrete uh, economic, political leverages that any uh, Asian country uh, have vis-a-vis -vis Iran or the U.S. Um, that can be put um, to good in, in, to good use. Well, I think uh, there must be ways uh, for doing to influencing both the United States and Iran. Uh, very many countries do have regular consultation with Iran. And I myself took part in this uh, regular consultation. Iranians are, in fact, very anxious to have uh, the uh, kind of uh, interface with the rest of the world. Therefore, there must be a room for us to convince Iran that uh, indeed uh, the, uh, you know, the negotiated settlement would be the right thing. And for this negotiated settlement, it would have to be comprehensive. It just cannot be the repetition of a small uh, scoped uh, nuclear agreement. It would have to include very many other elements as well. The, when European Free started dialogue with Iran, that was to uh, conclude much more comprehensive uh, arrangement, inclusive of economic cooperation and all sorts of things. Therefore, the way we should, should be heading is a possibility of having comprehensive agreement with Iran. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis United States, it must be more difficult because in our period of time, I was a deputy foreign minister about 15, more than 15 years ago. At that time, there are people, there are people in the US administration to whom we can talk. 
But this administration, there's a question of the reliable people in the administration. And again, it must be much easier for, it, for somebody to talk to Trump. That's the reason why I say Abe has got tremendous chance of, you know, to, to have diplomacy work because he constantly talk with Trump. I'm not entirely sure if Abe will be able to influence Trump so that uh, Trump change the course of their policy to Iran. But one thing is very clear in my mind, unlike John Bolton, Trump is wanting to have an impact on the US domestic scene. And he is a person who pursue transaction. There is a chance here if we were able to, uh, to, to talk to Trump. And the same thing applies to DPR, uh, the North Korea. Again, why are we having this situation, meaning that North Korea stopped nuclear testing, stopped ballistic long range, medium range, ballistic missile testing? Because of the fact that Trump and Kim Jong-un had a direct negotiation. Therefore, I, mean, I don't like Trump at all, but yet there is a chance for the issue like Iranian issue or North Korean issue to be tattooed through direct talk to Trump. Uh, and I just mentioned uh, uh, China and uh, uh, UK, Germany, France, Russia, uh, China, uh, China, China, continue to try to work for, uh, keep the Iranian nuclear deal and uh, try to persuade the US to return to the framework or oh, even not very uh, uh, hopeful, yeah. But also I, I want to mention uh, many East Asian countries like Japan, India, South Korea, even Turkey, all want to try to play some role through the media industry. And uh, <clears throat> uh, no longer I joined a conference in Istanbul, a China-US dialogue on Afghanistan, so my friend told me now really we need uh, help. Uh, without China's help, U.S. cannot leave Afghanistan. I cannot find a way to, uh, to work with uh, North Korea. And also, uh, we need some help from China for the Iranian nuclear issue. So I think East Asian country uh, we still can work for this uh, through the different channel. Uh, Japan have uh, official alliance channel and North South Korea also. Uh, Turkey and India and China, we can also work for this. And uh, even, not very hopeful, <laughs> but we will continue work for this. Um, I am awfully realistic about uh, what we can do. Singapore is a small country, um, and frankly speaking, I, I would be quite um, skeptical about the amount of direct influence we have on both these countries. Um, of course, our larger neighbors, India, China, <clears throat> which are big markets for Iran, <clears throat> um, I think, and certainly in the Middle East, uh, it's definitely a large uh, buy of the tremendous amount of oil that comes through the Strait of Hormuz. I think they would, I would, as my panelists have said, they may be able to exert a little bit more influence. Um, so, to um, our very honourable moderator's question, I think for Singapore, it will be uh, quite realistic about the role we can play, but we have an excellent foreign service and very esteemed diplomats, uh, and I'm sure they can work out something if they're, if they're asked to do something about it. Thank you all very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, please join me in thanking our panellists for their insightful remarks on the issue.